But the question is, where does the Supreme Court get the power to do this sort of thing? The Supreme Court got its power in the case uh, Murbury uh, versus Madison in, in 1803. In that case there, this is where the precedent for the Supreme Court having the power to strike down laws is unconstitutional. It's from that decision that they get this power from. So it's nowhere in, in the constitutions that say that the Supreme Court has the power to strike things down as constitutional or unconstitutional. But the Supreme Court took that power upon itself and as a result over, you know, over 100, uh, 200 years of, of history, yeah, the Supreme Court has intervened time and time again. Now, the Founding Fathers never had this vision for the Supreme Court to have this much power, especially if you think about it, it's nine unelected people uh, and all it takes is five of them to decide to vote on something and then, you know, that's the law of the land. Doesn't matter what the Congress does, doesn't matter what the, the different states uh, vote on, it's a thing of this is the law and the only way to actually change that is to have a different court at a later date when there's a different case before it for them to either decide to change it or for you to go through the, the whole process of a constitutional amendment which again we'll get into a bit later. The Supreme Court rather than enforcing the law as such yeah like kind of end up in some regards creating new law. So we saw this heap of very contentious Supreme Court decisions. For instance, you had Citizens United, uh, which said that free, like money equals free speech. So that allowed people to like give whatever donations they wanted. So candidates could get billions and billions of, of or millions and millions, yeah, but uh, feasibly they, they could have, have an unlimited amount. They could have billions of uh, just for their campaign. On, on the other hand, like you also have cases like Roe v. Wade, uh, where, where it was decided that uh, abortion would be legalised across all the different states, regardless of what the different states uh, are legislated for. For all these cases, you could say, oh, well, I support this or support that, but the point being that no one voted for it, except for these like nine justices who are not subject to any kind of democratic accountability and so their decision is final and you know they, they have no checks and balances in that regard once they've made the decision. If it goes to the Supreme Court we could end up having the presidency picked by nine justices, six of which are, are likely to lean towards Donald Trump anyway, three of whom were actually appointed by this president himself. It's unlikely that if someone gives you this job for life that all of a sudden you're going to vote like kind of to take them out of office. The decision could end up coming down to these very small group of people. We have to ask ourselves, is in, in the 21st century, is this necessarily the way that America should be governed moving forward? I'm not saying it should be one way or the other, but I'm just asking the question and many people in the country are asking these kind of questions as to, is this the way that, just because it's always been this way, is there anything that we can do to tweak this? Is there anything that we need to radically change? Do we need to keep this exactly the same? Is this a system that works or is it not a system that works? We'll get into this in a bit in terms of where public opinion really stands on these kind of issues. Now, many people from outside of America and even many people, unfortunately, inside America will be very confused with this, this talk about electoral college, yeah? People really need to get their head around the fact that just because the majority of people in America voted for a, a, a person does not mean that they automatically become president. And just so that people don't get on a high horse about this, um, this is the case across most countries in the world. In Britain, for instance, in the 1951 um, uh, election, Winston Churchill re-won the, uh, like, his, it, like, his role as being prime minister and beat Clamatley, who was um, running for the, the Labour Party. But the Labour Party actually had more votes than the Conservative Party in that election. Um, and it's happened multiple times around, you know, a, a, like around the world and stuff. Uh, in, you know, in Australia, in, I believe, Germany, in Italy, in many, many places. So people around the world need to get off their high horse in terms of thinking that your head of state is picked by whoever got the most votes. That is not the case in, uh, uh, yeah, it's not really the case at all. So if that's the case, how are people like chosen? In Britain, uh, our, our prime minister is the leader of the biggest party in the country. So whichever party has won the most amount of seats, that ends up being, you know, the leader of that ends up being the prime minister. That's very different from how it is in America. The House of Representatives, for instance, yeah, which is kind of the equivalent of, of our House of Commons, yeah. Just because that might vote a certain way does not mean automatically that the president will be from that party. So for instance, in America, you might have a Republican president, you might have uh, a Democratic House of Representatives and a Republican Senate. So this is what it has been 
for this election. Sound Fathers of America set up in this way. They wanted government to be divided because for them, they were really scared of government tyranny. And so they didn't want what you have in the British system whereby you win an election and then you've just got like absolute majority. The prime minister and, and the party can just put through whatever policies they want. America has these checks and balances. You know, you have the presidency, you have the legislature, which is like the House of Congress, and you have the Supreme Court. And all of these competing interests here make it so that it's very difficult for a radical to come in and completely change the system. The question is this year, on what day is the president actually picked? Some people will say, oh, it's the first Tuesday in November, right? So for this year, it was November 3rd. Um, um, that's actually not the right answer. So that's that's when the nationwide election is for the presidency. But that's not actually when the president is picked. The president is picked actually on the second Wednesday of December. Huh? How can you have a na nationwide election in November, but the president's actually picked in December. This is where the Electoral College comes in. The Founding Fathers really, really, really did not like the idea of democracy, right? These were very learned people and they looked into the history of ancient Rome, ancient Greece and many other places, right? And they came to the conclusion that democracy was not good. Like, it was really bad. Like, it was really, really bad. And the reason for this is because they were all landowners, they had business interests, etc, etc. And for them, they were worried that if you've got 1% of people who have a lot of money, the other 99% of people can vote to take that money away. So if you're protecting people's property, if you're protecting people's wealth, you don't want a democratic system. You want to have some checks and balances on the power of the people as well. So that's why America is a republic. It's founded as a republic. You will find nowhere in the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence, the word democracy. And the only time any one of the founding documents that you will find the word democracy is in the Federalist Papers, which is a paper, uh, you know, a set of papers where some of the different founding fathers came together and argued explicitly that America should not be a democracy for that exact reason, to protect the private property of wealthy people. So in theory, there's actually nothing to stop these uh, electors, yeah, these 538 people who come from the different states, yeah, they're chosen by the different state legislatures. There's nothing to stop these 538 people. Say for instance, in 2016, Hillary lost like that election. Right? If all 538 of these people decided, hey, we want Hillary Clinton to be president, they could do it. If they decided that they wanted Bernie Sanders, who wasn't even running the thing to be president, they could do it. If they wanted, well, they can't make me that kind of like president because A, I'm not old enough and B, I wasn't born in America. Um, but anyway, like if they decide to pick anyone who's eligible to be president to become the president, that could happen, right? If they want Kanye West to be president, they can vote for that to happen. So on December the 9th, if the people in uh, who make up the electoral college yeah vote for Kanye West to be president guess what Kanye West is the president and there would be nothing unconstitutional about that even though like for instance he only got a handful of votes relatively speaking there's still nothing to say unconstitutionally that he couldn't be president i know mind blown right is it precedent for this to, to happen are, are they likely to do that well while there wouldn't be a constitutional crisis we can definitely imagine there'd be a democratic crisis if this was to happen and actually we did see inklings of this in the 2016 election right so in the 2016 election there were eight so-called faithless electors right so these are people who from different states decided actually no even though my state has voted this way we are not voting that way so we had a vote for Bernie Sanders. We had a vote for Ron Paul, who wasn't even like running in any of these kind of things. He hadn't run since like 20, 2012. John Kasich, who was like defeated, like kind of like in the Republican primaries. And then also Faith Spotted Eagle, um, who is a Native American, like kind of like American Indian uh, activist, who is like, like a really big advocate against the Keystone uh, pipeline and stuff that went through uh, the Indian reservation there. So these people, they said, oh yeah, we want this guy to be president. We want this, this guy to be president. And there's actually nothing to stop them from being able to do that. When the electoral college actually comes together and votes for who they want to be president, if Joe Biden ends up winning it, but they decide that actually we want Donald Trump to be the president, there's nothing to stop this from happening. And so you might say that this is quite an insane system, but there's also arguments for it, right? So 
to play devil's advocate for it, if you had a situation where Adolf, where Adolf Hitler rose to power in Germany, he his party, the Nazi party, was the largest party. There was nothing really stopping him from becoming dictator because of the constitution of Weimar Germany. However, if someone like Hitler came to power in America, say Hitler, like you know, or the equivalent of him, became the president of America, well, he'd have both houses of Congress, which might like, kind of be against him. He has the Supreme Court, which might be against him. He has all the different states, which might be against him. And beside that, if, for instance, these people in the Electoral College went, whoa, hold on, that's crazy. The people want Hitler. No, we don't want Hitler. Yeah, we're voting against it. We're voting for anyone else except for him, right? Under that system, they would be able to stop someone like Hitler, like an actual tyrant, from rising to power. And that's the whole reason why the American Constitution was set up as it was, because the big thing that the founding fathers were scared of was tyranny. And so how do you make it so that it's impossible for someone to become a tyrant? So as much as people are saying Trump is basically Hitler or this or that, is, you know, he's acting like a dictator, even when he was elected and he, he had majority of the House and of the Senate and the presidency, he still wasn't able to do whatever he wanted. He still couldn't build a wall. He still couldn't do this. He still couldn't do that, etc., etc., right? You know, it doesn't matter, like, kind of, if you're the president, yeah, there's certain things that you simply cannot do. And because of that, people both in America and in, in the rest of the world are really, really focus too much on the presidency and really kind of, we'll get into this in a bit, in terms of actually how powerful is the president really. However, as you can imagine, quite a lot of Americans are opposed to this system for the very simple fact that like, most of them don't think it's very likely that someone like Hitler is going to rise to power. And therefore, it's a bit of an overreaction, a bit of a over, over precaution, and there's other checks and balances. So why do we have to go through this process every year of having this electoral college, which doesn't really make sense, and is it, you know, it's complicated, and it's all blah, 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 okay? Most Americans, since Poland began on this in 1967, have consistently said that, actually, we want to get rid of the electoral college. It doesn't really make sense. Up until 2016, this was very non-partisan. People from both parties were like, eh, hey, yeah, this system makes sense like it's long like but there's never enough of a strong strong movement to actually get it repealed because to change the u.s constitution you need two-thirds of both the house and the senate and three quarters of the states and throughout the whole history of america america has only had 27 amendments that shows you how difficult it is to actually put amendments in the constitution yeah and the last one we that we had was in 1992 right so in my lifetime there has never been another amendment put to the constitution. So trying to overturn the electoral college would take a monumental kind of like, like level of support in, in the nation. And clearly at the moment, there isn't that. So in 2011, look at some of the stats here, right? 2011, you had 69% of Democrats and you had 54% of Republicans nationwide who supported this. However, 2016 happened and obviously the electoral college favored the Republicans. And actually in 2000, it favoured the Republicans. And in 1888, it also favoured the Republicans. So in all three of those elections, the majority of people voted Democrat, and yet the Republican candidate ended up winning. So Republicans kind of put two and two together. It's like, actually, this system seems to benefit us. So yeah, about changing that. So now, since 2016, it's now 81% of the Democrats, because they're thinking, hey, we can actually win some elections now. And... The Republicans, 19%. So now it's become a partisan issue. And even in 2018, 75% of Democrats and just 32% of Republicans supported, right? So nationwide, there is still a majority for it, right? There's 54% to 41% who, you know, who are opposed it. So it could still be done. At the same time, good luck trying to get a divided Congress, yeah, uh, which is pretty much split 50-50 to try and have two-third decision for this. And then never mind the different states, yeah, what, you're going to have 38 out of the 50 states voting on this when, you know, about like 25 of those states, were, like kind of like in, in, in any given election, are going to vote for Republicans. Yeah, good luck with that. Um, the electoral college skewers the power of the states, yeah, more towards the smaller states. And this is part of why the constitution was set up in the way it was. The founding fathers, they wanted to have a balance between the bigger states wanted more representation, but the smaller states wanted the states to be represented more, right? So it's a balancing act, again, between the more populous states 
and the le le and the least populous states. States that have very small populations, the, the electoral college favours them. And most of those states are rural and they vote Republican. So again, there's inbuilt re reason as to why it's going to be very, very difficult, if not impossible, for this to ever be changed. However, does it necessarily need to go to the to the uh, constitution? Do we need to have a constitutional amendment to do that? that? All that seems a little bit long and a bit excessive, right? We've got 54% of people who want something, yeah? And only 41% of people who oppose it. Surely we should be able to, to, like, to change it about, right? It could be done on a state-by-state -state basis. And actually, some like, two states in the union really do this, yeah? Maine and Nebraska, if a district yeah, votes a certain way, that ends up being counted for that party, right? So in Maine, if one of the districts end up voting for the Democrats and the other one votes for Republicans, that gets counted as one vote for the Democrats, one vote for the Republicans, right? And you know, it kind of goes on that way for, for Nebraska as well. So actually nothing to stop the rest of the states from doing that. However, the problem is, uh, is the kind of classic uh, argument about unilateral disarmament, right? Say for instance, California, which leans heavily towards Democrats, if they decide that of, like, instead of giving their 55 electors yeah, to the Democrats, is that if they want to have this kind of more proportional kind of like, thing where actually if one district went Republican, then, then it goes this way, et cetera, et cetera, right? That's fine. But at the same time, if that's not reciprocated in Republican leading states like Texas, then you basically just like handed some extra points to the opposition and they're not given any in return. So it would re require a great deal of trust across all 50 states, right? And actually, if one state decided, actually, we're not doing that, there's actually nothing constitutionally to, like, to actually enforce that, right? So even if you were to pass a law in Congress which said that the different states have to do this, yeah, I'm not sure whether that could be passed. I'm not sure whether that would just get thrown out by Supreme Court offhand. But regardless of whether they allowed it to be passed or not, if at any point this were to happen in a future election, the federal government can't turn around to the states and say, you have to do this, yeah? It would be it would be ruled out as unconstitutional. So it, actually, the only way to make sure that it's actually set in stone and can't be changed is to do it constitutionally. But probably the quicker way, if one wanted to change it, would be to go through this route. It could, yeah, it could be done. It could be done. At the same time, there's arguments, again, for the, for the electoral college because... Again, it's this balancing between the smaller states because otherwise, if you just have a popular vote, the candidates are just going to flock to the major cities. Yeah, they're going to flock to LA, New York, like Chicago, etc. And the vast majority of the country is just going to be completely left, right? All the rural places, all the kind of suburban places, all these places where not so many people necessarily live are just going to be forgotten, right? Uh, kind of, and so everything's going to be very urban focused. Like America is a vast, vast country. If you think about it, if you think of the difference between Hawaii and Alaska and and uh, Maine and and uh, California or Florida and Texas, you know, the West Virginia versus you know um, uh, Oregon, like the needs of all these places are so so disparate, right? It requires a, a, a system which doesn't just mean that everyone gravitates to the major cities because. If everyone just did that, then the huge swathes of the country, which already feel underrepresented, which already feel abandoned by people, which already feel kind of left behind, quote unquote, these places are going to feel even more so if you end up having a popular uh, vote kind of thing. So are there compromises to this? I think we can come up with some. The popular vote in and of itself isn't, isn't the best and having like the electoral college isn't necessarily the best. Is it a thing where we do need to move towards having a system whereby the electors of each state, it's mandated that they have to vote for how the different districts voted. Because that would give a far more balanced thing yet, right? Rather than it being a, a winner-takes-all kind of situation in each state, why can't we have what you have in Maine and Nebraska? Because then if the vote is narrow, it would be narrow, and it's, it's but it'd be a lot more proportional than what we have now. And so proportional as to disadvantage that the, the least powerful state so it, it still would preserve the power of the of the smaller states and representation of the smaller states while also throwing a bone to the vast swathes of people in in all the states who are completely abandoned right if you don't happen to live in a swing state no one cares about how you vote if you're in california whether you're a democrat or republican no one cares because we know that's going to go to the democrat no one's going to waste time campaigning there no one's going to listen to your interest doesn't matter how you vote 
because at the end of the day, California is always going to go Democrat, right? Or at least that's that's the conventional thinking. And the same thing with Republicans. Up until recently, it was thing where yeah, Texas, yeah, it's it's, it's fine. It's going to always go that way. That's not very representative, and this is a big problem we have with representation across that kind of the world. Because how do you actually represent what people want? Like I said at the beginning, like kind of America probably expects far too much from its president, and so does the rest of the world. The president was never meant to have this much power in the constitution the president is limited to a very select range of, of, of things mostly to do with foreign policy and you know representing the, the the nation on the world stage so in that regard he's head of state but then also at time of war he's the commander-in-chief he's the head of the armed forces or he or she you know the idea of the president being almost like this king or this emperor and stuff yeah up until the progressive era of about you know the turn of the last century yeah so you're talking like the 1900s you never really had presidents having such a massive role and coming in on platforms saying we're going to do this and we're going to do that and etc etc right this was not how things were intended to be so when the president kind of comes on the thing and says right I, I, i'm going to lower your taxes i'm going to raise your taxes and we're going to spend this much and we're going to like kind of cut the spending by this much or blah blah blah, blah etc etc right that power is not with the president the, pa the president has the power to veto policies right but all tax and spending policies have to arise from the houses of congress okay same thing with foreign policy a president can go i want to make this but this this trade deal i want to do this etc etc it has to be approved by the senate so the power of the presidency is limited right we shouldn't think that the president's going to come in and oh my god the world's going to end like kind of like like you know if if, if donald trump like kind of gets in he's going to do xyz if joe biden gets in it's going to be xyz because actually the president doesn't have as much power as we think he does and to the extent that they have they think they have the power and people think they have that power it's not how things were intended to be so what can we do to kind of like get back to, to the system or do you wish to come back to the system i'm going to now get into a quote from james madison who is one of the founding fathers who wrote the federalist papers and this was something that he said about democracies there is nothing to check the, in, the inducements to sacrifice the weak party or an obnoxious individual hence it is that such democracies have ever been spectacles of turbulence and contention have ever been found incompatible with personal security over the rights of property and have in general been as short in their lives as they have been violent in their deaths. Now, if you understand why the that founding fathers were very skeptical about having a, a democratic America, even the Senate, for instance, yeah, up until 1913, senators were appointed by the states; they were not directly elected by the people. But the founding fathers tried as much as possible to kind of stop there from being governments with too much power, stop there from being this kind of excess of democracy where there's you know, as, as, as they refer to it, the, the tyranny of the majority, right? Because yes, you want to have representation and stuff. Yes, you want there to be like people power. You want like, you know, democracy. But at the same time, there also has to be this system of checks and balances because if there's not, if, if the government is not kept in check, if a different branch is not kept in check, if even to an extent the people themselves are not kept in check because we're not perfect here. Yeah? Like we're not like pe people in their daily lives, yeah, make mistakes, right? And you know, millions of people can make mistakes as such, you know, like kind of in the, in the grand scheme of things. And obviously that's completely subjective, what's a mistake and what's not a, a mistake. But at the end of the day, humans in a, in a complex society need checks and balances. Otherwise, if one part side has too much power, then it means that the other side is going to be very hostile towards that. When the stakes end up being this high, and when the, the tension is this high, and when the, the level of distrust is this high, be careful because America is not perfect. The liberal democracy is not perfect, but it is, as, as, as Churchill said, it is the worst form of government except all others that have been tried from time to time. And if you want to continue to have the freedoms and have the, the, the people power that we've been born into and stuff, and which many other places in the world envy, then we ought to be a bit more careful in how we actually preserve and keep a continuous existence.